Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Computer History Museum. I'm John Holler, the CEO, and it's a pleasure for me to welcome you tonight. Uh, someone once remarked to me that uh, one way of looking at what we do here at the museum is to tell the history of the future. And if that is really true, uh, it's true mainly because of the accomplishments and the vision and the drive of Gordon Bell. Um, we are happily familiar here at the museum with people who have greatly innovative minds. Uh, men and women who have dreamed great dreams and who have made them happen and who have brought profound change to the world and who have built enduring institutions as the result of that. And when we think of people who are in that category, uh, certainly Gordon Bell occupies a special place in our hearts and minds. He is, of course, a founding member of the trustee, uh, founding trustee, rather, of the museum and so much more, as you saw in the film tonight. Uh, he has given generously in so many ways to us and to our predecessor, the Computer History Museum in Boston, our collection, which is the largest in the world, has as its backbone the vast personal collection that Gordon accumulated and donated over the years. He was such a pioneer in uh, building many computers as an industry and as a result building the great DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation. The Gordon Bell Prizes in Supercomputing recognize the world's greatest achievements in that field. Uh, he's advised or invested in more than 100 companies and since 1995 Gordon has turned his attention at Microsoft as a principal researcher at Microsoft Research to the next frontiers of computing, which is the same thing really as saying the next frontiers of the human imagination and innovation. So his legacy of ambitious thought and action uh, might well have been expected to lead us to the question that we ponder tonight, but the question is so large and so profound that it bears repeating at the outset, which is, what if you could remember everything? Gordon, who is 75, began working on that question in 1999, and as we will learn tonight, he and his colleague in Microsoft Research, Jim Gimmel, co-developer of the My Life Bit software, which we'll learn about in much more detail, have not only just introduced the concept of being able to remember everything, but to assemble it in an accessible way that augments human memory through technology to achieve, as the title of their new book suggests, total recall. So we're extremely fortunate to have Gordon and Jim here tonight, uh, along with all of us, and it's going to be quite an evening. If you're wondering what we might make of all of this, consider the advice from a recent review of Total Recall. And the quote was this. Just because Gordon Bell and Jim Gimmel are way out there on the nerd spectrum, don't ignore what they have to say. So speaking for an institution that proudly welcomes everyone who occupies every point along the nerd spectrum, because those are the people who end up doing wonderful things, I'm delighted to welcome Gordon to the podium tonight to get us started. Ladies and gentlemen, Gordon Bell. Actually, I, I want to thank Sheridan Forbes who put, put, put this part of my life to, together from My Life Bits. And uh, now my part's easy. All I'm going to do is introduce Jim Gamel, who is really the uh, architect and builder uh, responsible for building My Life Bits, which was the basis for letting us dream and to write about uh, Total Recall. So, Jim? Gordon. Thanks. Um, I'm losing my mind. Opens our book. Not that I need a psychiatrist, uh, but that I find I need things like this more and more often. Where did I park the car? What time was that appointment supposed to be? When am I supposed to wrap up this talk? <laughs> well, what if you could remember everything? 
everything you've ever read, everything you've ever seen, everything you've ever heard, and much more that we're not used to thinking of as parts of our memory, your location, the temperature, the humidity outside, the light level, acceleration in a world full of sensors. If you want, you can have total recall, uh, as much or as little as you like, but certainly much more than ever before. Starting now and building over the next 10 years on three streams of technology. The first is recording and sensors, and already the portable digital cameras that we have and our cell phones that can take pictures and record sound and sometimes even location and so on, have already unleashed the beginning of this trend, along with scanners that let us get rid of our paper. This is going to multiply to recording everything that goes on in our computers and throughout our world. Miniaturized sensors are going to abound and we're going to instrument just about everything that can be instrumented. Storage, cheap and abundant. Part of our inspiration here was realizing how hard it would be to fill up the kind of storage that we're going to come up with. And then the software that lets us recall all of those bits, lets us search for things, do data mining and discover trends, and then visualize it and try and make sense out of it. Due to those three streams of technology, we think that total recall is inevitable. It's coming, ready or not, here you go. Now, a little clarification about what we're not talking about. We're not life bloggers uh, like the Jenny Cam or uh, uh, the Justin TVs or the people who are putting their whole lives up on the internet. Uh, Gordon and I think those people are crazy. Um, now, if you want to do that, go ahead. That, that's fine, but it seems very risky to us and, and we're not into that. We're into life logging, not life blogging. Like, this, like the diary with a lock and a key on it. It's my personal stuff and it's locked down. That said, let me tell you a little bit about how we got into this and how we have the experience uh, that convinced us how important this is going to be. Uh, as mentioned, back around 1999, uh, Gordon got the notion to be paperless. He wanted to be a great teleworker, able to work anywhere and not have to worry about where his papers were in his files. So he starts scanning. And then we said, well, why just paper? Uh, what if we scan absolutely everything we could and put it in our hard drive? So he started taking this on as a goal, pulling down posters and paintings off the wall and scanning them. Metals turned out to scan really nice, although they could be tough to photograph for lighting reasons. Old uh, notebooks. There's the VAX memo is one of the pieces of paper that went in where he proposes the VAX system. And so he built up this huge collection of stuff. And then we said, well, you got it. Now what can you do with it? Can you find any of that stuff? Can you organize that much? Once you find it, will you know what the thing is? I mean, he brought up some photos and said, well, there's a photo. I have no idea what it's a photo of. Once you found it once, can you find it again? So finally, Gordon came to me about 2001. Just really, he says, it's all just a bunch of bits. I can't do anything with this. And that's when I got involved. Say, well, maybe we need to write some software for this. Our boss, Jim Gray, chimed in. He says, have you invited the write once, read never memory? <laughs> So we started building software, putting everything into a database. And my LifeBits, which is really a suite of software, bringing in files, allowing you to make comments on things, recording every web page that we see, our chat sessions, our email, recording Gordon's telephone calls. So if you phone his office, you hear recording so that we don't break the law. TV, radio, screensavers that let you rate and make comments on it, GPS trails logging everything that goes through our computer, everything we could. And then uh, Lindsay Williams in our Cambridge lab invented something called the SenseCam. I'm wearing one right now. It's uh, an automatic camera, tries to take pictures at good times. So if the light level, it detects the light level, if that changes uh, abruptly, it figures, well, maybe you've walked through the threshold of a doorway or in a new room, time to take a picture. If the passive infrared detector, the little bubble on the front, detects a warm body, it says, oh, you might have a friend around, let's take their picture. If the accelerometers tell that it's jiggling, it says, hold on, let's wait and not take a blurry picture. 
With sense cam, you snap a lot of pictures in a hurry. Here's someone's day in uh, Cambridge, uh, England, and you saw earlier Gordon walking around, uh, I think down near Monterey, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going to let it run here till we see uh, eating, which is always really fun to see your plate <laughs> disappear here. So, the sense cam, one of the neat things about automatic capture like this is you capture moments that you otherwise never pull out the camera and use. Um, I have here the moment uh, I, I first met Ben Schneiderman. I would never have stopped and taken his picture. He's about to reach out and shake my hand. Um, one fellow in Dublin, uh, Ireland wore one of these for a year straight, 16 hours a day, and he caught the moment that he met his girlfriend for the first time. Not that he knew she would be his girlfriend at the time. He had no reason to take the picture. And uh, other special moments, I, the gestures of Peter Hart. I, to me, this takes me back to the lunch to have his animated manner. It's wonderful. Or uh, bumping into a colleague at a hotel desk where I didn't expect to meet him. Capturing every step, where you've been, the story of your travels, recording uh, meetings. Uh, here's the story of what's going on on my computer. How much time am I spending in different applications and how much time on the computer in different hours and getting a handle on that. My Life Bits isn't a product, it was just a proof of concept. Um, I'm happy to say that we also got a lot of colleagues doing research on this. And so what we talk about isn't just based on My Life Bits, but about some really wonderful work that uh, we like to boast about that others have done. We had uh, 14 universities that we funded and many, many others who joined us in our Carpe workshop. And through that, we've seen experience enough to see where we're headed to and know we really want it. I don't have time to talk about all the benefits of Total Recall. You have to read the book for that. But I want to touch on just a few tonight on memory and health, life and afterlife. Um, but I'll just mention with this picture here, one is the decluttering of your life. Uh, we didn't realize this, but once you start scanning everything and digitizing it and getting rid of stuff, it's a wonderful feeling. Gordon calls it the feng shui of digital life. Let's talk about memory. Human memory is plagued by all kinds of problems from that I can't remember where I parked to not heading to the grocery store to pick up eggs and coming home with something else and uh, revising our memories over time. And of course, the electronic memories are just cold and cruel and digital and exacting. And it feels a lot different. Here's looking through part of your life, the visualization that comes from Mary Cherwinsky's team, and saying, well, let's look at what, what was going on last year. And it reformats to show you what you have for that. And well, how about, let's look by location. Last year in Florida, what do we have there? And then, once we see what's going on in Florida, dropping that restriction and saying, well, let's just look at Florida in general, not just last year in Florida. It's a real difference from human memory. Here's a, here's a shot of the same UI shown on 18 LCD screens. And this is the kind of thing that, it, it's kind of mind-blowing when it's your stuff. I know you look at it here and it might be a little abstract, but Gordon, the first time we brought this up, I think he stood in front of it for about 10 minutes, just kind of, wow, you know, there's my life laid out. Trying to remember things in a system like this, you know, I, I wanted to find some email. I knew that we'd had a discussion in email about storage, and that guy said that really cool thing. That's what I was after. So try searching for that. But when you've got all the different attributes available, I searched for storage for the storage that I got 5,000 different emails. But when I went in and I looked at the email and I looked at who had sent it and I sorted it by the frequency of who it's coming from, most of it was myself and Gordon and Jim Gray. And it was quick to go down to the guy who did it and narrow it down to 20 things to sift. We kind of sift our way through our memories like that. If you have a record of all your phone calls, then you can do things like, let's say Gordon's talking to his real estate agent. He was selling his house at one point, and the real estate agent says, oh, uh, we're, on, we're on the phone. Look at this comparable property. Here's the, here's the website. And he looks it up, and they talk about it together. And then, say a month later, Gordon wants to look at that again. What's he going to search for? Real estate? House? 
wouldn't be helpful at all. But he remembers who his real estate agent is, and if he goes and looks up phone calls with her and says, well, what happened at the same time as the phone call, then he can get back to the, the things that happened at the same time, and there's the web page, which, by the way, is no longer on the web anymore because the property sold, but he has a copy of it forever. How about health? I was with Gordon after uh, some bypass surgery and the doctor came in and said, oh, let's see how you're doing, Gordon. And he looked at his chest and he goes, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I think it's looking better. Okay, you look good to discharge by the weekend. And he left and Gordon laughed and he said, uh, I said, what's that all about? And he said, well, I want to go home for my birthday this weekend, but I have this strange rash and they're worried about an infection. And, uh, you know, so if it doesn't get better, they won't let me go home. I said, oh, it's good. The doc says it's, it's looking better. He said, yeah, but it's not. I said, well, how do you know? He says, well, I've been taking a picture of it every day with my digital camera. <laughs> and I've been comparing it, and I know it's not getting any better at all, but he thinks so, so good. So he went home and enjoyed his birthday. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, it turned out not to be a serious infection or anything like that, so he got away with it. But that shows how... Uh, a lot of our health is just subjective, it's qualitative, we want it more quantitative. And what's going on right now with health records, you know, with paper-based health records, um, one study found that even though they had the patient's chart 95% of the time, 81% of return visits had problems with missing information. RAND estimated the U.S. could save 77 billion each year with the electronic health records. And others have estimated we might be able to save 100,000 lives. We believe in health records by the individual for the individual. We think that you are the center of the universe of your health records. They belong to you. And so far, it's just been impractical to deal with them. But let's get a hold of them. And Gordon has worked on this. He's gotten all his health records and digitized them. And when you think about when the, he had to go to hospitals and to different GPs and specialists and labs, I mean, they're strewn all over the place in many different formats. But once you bring them together, you get a lot of value out of it. And he um, actually, is it okay if I mention going to the hospital last week? He, he ended up in the hospital last week in a strange hospital and th that he'd never been to before. And they wanted to run a test on him. And they nearly ran a test using something that he's allergic to. And fortunately, Sheridan remembered, said, oh, oh don't, don't do that. And Gordon said, oh, I had all that stuff on my USB stick. And he says, maybe I should have brought it. He says, on the other hand, I've got everything on my USB stick. So, <laughs> so we're learning about what are the kind of the top five things you need to have really handy in your health records when you go to, the, go to see the doc. Um, this is a My Health Bits interface that the University of Pittsburgh did, trying to work with that. So once we have all our records digitized and they're ours and we're ready to go and it helps us get second opinions and shop around doctors, now let's go even further. How about automatically tracking more of our health? Already here's stuff that Philips sells today where you can in the home uh, stand on a scale that will record your weight. You can have a blood pressure cuff that will wirelessly uh, transmit to the base station and this can also go out to your doctor and the lady there is doing a blood oxygen level I think. And, there's several others. Going further, we can wear stuff all the time. Gordon and I are both wearing one of these body bugs right now that's tracking a whole bunch of uh, heat flux and a number of things, knows the calories that we're burning. And, um, and eventually, we're going to get into smart fabrics where it's just in the clothes that we wear. It'll just be natural. You put on the shirt, and it's going to track the calories that you burn and your heart rate and so on. And going even further, there's some stuff you can only find out from inside your body. Eventually, we'll have in-body sensors that'll uh, tell us all kinds of things. So here's a, a camera that you swallow and a nanobot and a, a wireless pressure se sensor and an aneurysm sac. So measuring the pressure and then wirelessly telling the outside what's going on. So the payoff for health e-memories, first of all, is what I, I mentioned before, quantitative instead of qualitative. Instead of going in the doctor and, gee, I think I think I started feeling crummy on Wednesday, maybe, how long have I had that fever? Uh, not quite sure, a couple of days. No, you're going to go in, hey, look, here's the graph of my temperature. And here's my blood pressure daily for the last year, with hard data to work with. It turns out there's a lot of incentives to seeing your data. They've already run, there's been studies done showing that people are more likely to take their medication 
when they have data showing its, its effects. Um, I know I've been incentivized by this body bug to go, wow, you mean if I even just walk a bit, I see more calories being burnt? It's got me up and walking around more. Um, eventually, we'll discover correlations. We'll data mine this data and learn more about your health and what's going on. Uh, you can have proactive health advice when trends are discovered, electronic nurses, and um, maybe even anonymize the data to do studies on massive scales eventually. Finally, what does it mean to enjoy your e-memories and to pass them on? I, I overheard a lady in a restaurant saying to her friend, oh, I'm going to give you my cell phone number because you can't leave messages on my home phone. I've saved too many messages from my grandson. And that wasn't just because she wanted the transcript of his words. She wanted to hear his little voice again. And I know what it means to me. I have one of all my ancestors, I have one recording of a grandfather who spoke with a Scotch accent. It's very special to me to have that. It's a real difference to pass this on, much richer storytelling that we pass on. And uh, we've also observed that while most of my physical mementos collect dust up in the attic, I'm enjoying the ones that show up on my screensaver. At first people think, oh, you're kind of callous and hard, you don't care about your, your mementos. But no, actually I'm enjoying mine a lot more because they're digitized. And here, just by the nature of what they're like, I just want to show you a couple of things here. This is from Gordon's timeline, and we brought this up, pictures of his son. And down at the bottom here, you'll see this, it's sort of an upside down histogram showing the frequency of pictures. Didn't mean anything to me. Gordon immediately said, oh yeah, that's when Brigham went off to school, and here you can see these family visits, and here's the point where he has children, so grandkids, I take lots of pictures. Even the data, the frequency of the data tells a story to Gordon. Um, Pictures and location are so powerful. This is a trip of mine to Los Angeles. Uh, normally, this would have been labeled pictures of Los Angeles, and maybe I'd share it with someone. Uh, but I was wearing a GP carrying around a GPS, and so this, the pink is everywhere I went. Uh, the dots on the map show pictures I took. So here we are down at the beach and going back up to the hotel. And we can pick a particular trip within the larger trip. And, and animate how we drove back from the beach. And uh, I got back home from this weekend and said, wow, I've got, there's the story of my trip. I also had a calendar with all the events that I was going to, taking the kids to some sporty events. I thought, this is amazing. I could just kind of package this up, send it to my mom, and she'd know what the grandkids are doing, and no work for me. Good deal. And so in fact, we had an intern work on that, automatic blogs based on our data. Um, and going even a little further, this, this sense cam can easily snap a couple of thousand photos a day. Trying to automatically do something with that, uh, some wonderful work at Dublin City University says take the thousands of pictures in a day of the sense cam and segment them and summarize, do face detection and look for similar clothing, look at differences in accelerometers and GPSs, and all this with the goal of finding what's novel. So every day I eat breakfast at home. Boring. But the one day I go out for breakfast with someone special, unusual place, interesting. And they take the stuff that's more novel and show it as big and show the other stuff as little. And if you put your mouse over any of these in their interface, it'll give you that uh, stop motion kind of video play of what's going on. And so you get this nice little summarization of your day. Now that's a great story to pass on, but we can go even further. What about coming a little bit closer to true digital immortality? I once shared lunch with Ed Feigenbaum, and he told me, you know, when we started working on expert systems, we thought the picture would look like this. Oh, we got our logic component, we got our data component, and we'll do some really smart stuff. But he said, after a lot of experience, we learned that the picture looks more like this. That really what we want is lots and lots and lots of data, and we don't really need that much logic. Well, lots and lots and lots of data are us. We're bringing it to you. Here's this amazing corpus of a life. And uh, the people at mycybertwin.com took the transcripts of the Simpson shows, and they're able to simulate a little chat with Bart Simpson. That's pretty good. He can ask about his dad, and you can tell you that he's saving stuff for a brainy day. And if you ask about a pet, he'll say, who needs a pet when I have Homer? <laughs> Actually, I have a dog, too. I mean, it does a pretty good job. But you know what, the transcripts of The Simpsons are nothing compared to your life bits. And we think you'll be able to do an amazing job of simulating a person at the end of their life if you capture all of it. 
Total recall will be a revolution to our society and our culture. It'll be very significant. It's going to change what it's like to have this kind of fidelity of recording your life is unlike anything we've experienced before. We talk about the time before literacy as prehistory. It almost doesn't count. Well, soon we're going to talk about pre-total recall, those, those pathetic lives that just had some shoe boxes and a few records. The e-memory revolution is going to change everything. Thank you. And now we're going to ask uh, John and Gordon to join us back up here. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Gordon. And I just want to remind everyone you've got question <coughs> cards in your seats. So please be sure and use your pencils, fill out your question cards, and we'll be doing uh, question and answers in a few minutes. But I've got questions. I'm sure people have lots and lots of questions about this. Um, so Gordon, I want to go back to the beginning when you first started this. Was your, was your objective to take everything that you had up to that point and digitize it? Were you really thinking about the future and thinking about your life from that point on? No, it actually it was probably the only research I've ever done which was, I was just out playing. And, and I had a, a boss, Jim Gray, that, that let me do that. And uh, I started out uh, uh, with uh, Raj Reddy asking to scan all the books I had written. And I said, sure, if, you know, if we get in trouble, why? Microsoft's got a lot of lawyers, and we can get out of, <laughs> you know, out of, out of the problem. But uh, that kind of stimulated uh, the idea of, of getting rid of all the banker boxes of, of business plans and, and old notes and things that I had had from digital and, and other places. And so it started kind of from a paperless standpoint and then evolved into, well, let me get rid of more and more. And then, then it was like everything. And we uh, we started recalling Bill's, uh, Bill Gates' comment about someday you will be able to record everything you see and hear, and that was from a 1995 book. And those were kind of words that, that started it, and then I, so I did that for uh, uh, until uh, I thought I was done in 2001. I, I had most of the stuff scanned and, you know, CDs ripped and, and all the old movies, uh, VHS movies encoded, and uh, at that point, I, that was a point when I knew how much it cost to do it, but then I couldn't find anything. And I tried to, I tried to buy a couple companies, but Microsoft didn't want to buy them, and so uh, we ended up uh, uh, continuing and convincing uh, Jim and to, uh, in, to go on with that. And at what point did you realize this is a great tool for the future now. I can really begin to do things that maybe you hadn't even thought of at that point. I think, I think that just kept going all the time. We, we, the more, oppor more things that opened up, I mean, we were doing it, uh, uh, Roger Luter, who, who we worked, uh, worked with on this, uh, you know, came in one day and said, oh, last night I decided to, to capture all of the web pages you your, uh, that you ever visit, not just the URLs, but in fact the pages so you can get them. And, and so it was, uh, it was kind of, a, really it was research. We just kept finding nooks and crannies and then the, the, the sense cams, uh, Jim's got one and uh, we've got another one out there. Uh, that, was a, that one was a, uh, a great find because uh, that allowed us to do all this capture. Uh, or uh, audio, uh, uh, you know, picture capture. So it it just kept going, and 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 uh, as it points out, continues to go. You know, as you get better pacemakers. You know, my <laughs> my, my my new pacemaker doesn't have a an out <laughs> an output uh, an easy output, but uh, uh, you know, you can get a lot of data. That You're way. the output, right? Yeah, the, uh... yeah. The the fact that I'm vertical. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, these, you know, these, uh, the body bug is a device that I'm very, you know, I think Jim and I now are wearing them. And I had worn them, in, uh, you know, seven years ago when it came out. I thought it was a great device. I just wanted more, 
wanted more and more. And because I, I, you know, for a cardi anybody who's got a cardiac problems, you really would like to have your daily monitor or sure. instantaneous monitor of all that. So I want to talk about those cool devices in a minute, but let me yeah. go back. So Jim, in walks Gordon Bell, <laughs> and he has, I don't know, terabytes of data at this point, yeah. right? I mean, he has papers, video, CDs, speeches, pictures, realizes he can't find anything really well. Is that the point at which you encountered him? And what did you think? I mean, here's this, you know, a great deal of Gordon's work and life and everything, and all of a sudden you've got this project kind of walking in in the form of Gordon. Yeah, he didn't actually have, he didn't actually have terabytes to begin with. Okay. He, he had a bit as he scanned, I, you know, I imagine it was a few tens of gigabytes. And what we're actually inspired by is in our lab, the guys were working on the Terra server. And they were trying to do a big project to fill up a terabyte and put it on the web. And they're having such a hard time filling it up. They eventually found a bunch of ex-Soviet guys that gave them spy ph photographs. It was the only way they could fill the thing up. <laughs> so we had these guys in the office right beside us who go, wow, it sure is hard to fill up a terabyte. And meanwhile, we s we're projecting saying, by 2007, we're all going to have terabyte hard drives. So what would this mean personally? So we actually yeah. took you know, Gordon's problem and said, well, let's go wild. What if we just you know, really recorded everything? Had you been thinking about it already? Had you been thinking about this kind of my life bits, digitize my life and, and accumulate that? Was that? No, it, it really grew on us. We were looking at uh, telepresence and, and remote workers, as I said. That's why he was going paperless. And, yeah. and as we did it and we started working on it and we just saw, to begin with, is, is like, why did you climb the mountain? Because it's there. Why did you fill up your hard drive? Well, because we can. But as we began doing it, we started seeing utility, almost to our surprise. It's like, wow, this is worth a lot more than I thought. And eventually realized, gee, I actually kind of count on this. Like, I expect to have a flush toilet, and I expect to have every web page I see recorded. So this must have been inspirational, Gordon, once you discovered that uh, you were going to be able to develop a system to navigate it and find data. And, and was that, were, you, were you ready to throw in the towel before that, or did you know that that answer would eventually come? No, I, no, I didn't. I really didn't see that we would get that that far at that at that point in time. And as we were starting it, it was, you know, I was starting to be happy when, oh my God, we we've got a reasonable search uh, uh, way to search 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 your your uh, local your PC or your local local machine. And then we went. I'd say we went off for. Uh, maybe a year or two, or I went off for a year or two. I don't think Jim was, uh, Jim just put the tool for me to go off in, in the space of library, in the library world of trying to look at different ways of organizing uh, stuff. And I've got, because I'm a, fundamentally a taxonomist. Right. I mean, if anybody who knows Bell and Newell and all the, those early textbooks, right. and in fact the museum's uh, schema for uh, artifacts, those things were very important to me to be able to structure all that stuff. So it was natural. I wanted to structure all this information about my life. So I probably spent a, you know, I had 5,000 fish photographs. So, uh, you know, lots of different fish are nice things to organize. Lots of cute, I had all these computer images, great things to organize. And uh, uh, realized after about two years, like, you can't do this with your life. It's too, you know, you'll spend all of your life, or a little bit longer than your life, organizing <laughs> your life. And so, and, and along this, uh, particularly along all of this, why uh, it was a matter of, gee, no, I'm not going to, I'm an engineer, I'm not going to spend that amount of time if I get no benefit from all of this. And uh, no one is really going to spend this amount of time organizing their uh, their their life and so it was, you know. There's a you can you know. There's a magical program out there somewhere that will take all of this stuff and and make taxonomies and and uh, uh, schemas uh, uh, f uh, for it. But it but uh, it's that's research yet to do. Probably some of the most interesting research that you could do. So what was the moment for for both of you? What was the moment where you're collaborating on this? And, and you finally have a breakthrough. Gordon, you sort of say, aha, you know, now we're on to something. And, and Jim, you, you knew you were going to show something Gordon really special. 
Well, actually, mine was sort of a negative moment. I, I had always thought, oh, this is kind of fun, and I'm glad I had it. sort of a novelty sort of thing. And then uh, one day my hard drive crashed, and I lost four months' worth of web pages. And all, I, I, it upset me. I got really emotional over it. I felt like, oh, someone's you know, stripped my memories away from me. And I also, that was the day I realized I count on this now. I live this way expecting to have it. And to this day, I'll go looking for things, and they're not there. And I go, oh, that's right, that was during that four months. I mean, it really was an epiphany for me that this is a new way of life. Yeah. And Gordon, how about you? What, what did you see that suddenly made you think, I'm really on to something here? Uh, I guess there were a bunch of different moments, because I was always, as an engineer, always really looking for, okay, what is it that's key to, to all of this? And I think it was uh, maybe a, a couple of times when, uh, you know, actually most recently I was saying, well, what's this relationship between e-memory and biomemory? And I thought, ah, I've got it. My biomemory is really the metadata and the URL to my e-memory. Ground truth is the e-memory. My <laughs> life is there, that's what it's all about. Uh, and, uh, and all I need is just enough bits to find, to find, find all of those things. Uh, uh, or, you know, or, or I can, I've got so many different ways of going at it, whether it's time or space. Uh, so those were all, uh, or you know, when I go go someplace, I, you know, I literally am space independent. I can move anywhere now, and I, you know, all the all the things are there. And and also, it might have been an epiphany of when I decided to give virtually everything to the museum, all of the art, you know, papers, uh, or or seeing that I've only got you know a fairly small amount of of artifacts that I I really want or need. So there's a Tremendous dematerialization that comes from all this. You don't, I don't know, I just feel I don't need any, need, need things. And that, to me, the museum is even more valuable. That's where you put stuff. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, but it's also why I think the museum has to be a, a lot in. It has its, it needs its e memory too, because it's, it'll, it'll fill up and you also can't find anything. If you don't have a, an e memory, you can't find anything. Did you ever encounter a memory uh, or something that, that you, were, you were calling up in the form of data and think to yourself, well, I, I liked the memory better. I liked the way it was in my head a lot better than I like the thing I'm, I'm calling up now and sort of seeing as it actually occurred. It, I don't know. I think it's more the, more the other way. That you see that you, it's always bringing something up and, or, you know, if, if a screensaver is operating or, or if I happen to be, you know, for some reason be stumbling over something when I'm finding something else, why? Well, those, uh, those, those things, are memories that come back, very nice memories that, that come back. Mm -hmm. And they, in a way, they come back, uh, they come back in a ground truth fashion. You know, my, my bio memory may have it a, a lot better, uh, you know, or worse, uh, but, uh, uh, there's just so many times when I when it's actually saved, uh, when I found something, you know, I was uh, had to give a, uh, a commencement speech at, for Carnegie several years ago, and uh, and I was stumbling over, look at, rifling through this memory, looking for something, and I found a little saying over the, over a desk I had uh, when I was a head of engineering at Digital, and. Uh, and it was the. It became the basis. Uh, it pointed to a paper that I actually found on the web. I had enough bullets on the paper that I knew what it was all about. Uh, but it was uh, uh, advice to uh, uh, revolutionaries or something like that. And one of them was I always remember start many fires, which is something that I tend to do, uh, like to do, uh, yeah, metaphorically, so to speak. But uh, the uh, uh, that kind of thing. So there's so many times that I, fi I find something that way uh, that I'm grateful for having this that I wouldn't have found it. There's no other way to find find something <clears throat> like that. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions about uh, some of the obvious things. I know we're going to come up in the 
in the question cards. First, before we get to the, the key questions like what happens to the data when you lose it, where does it live in the cloud, is it secure, what about privacy, those kinds of things. Just talk for a minute, Jim, about the gadgets, the kind of the cool things that are available now for anybody who wanted to think about getting started on this because you've, you've discovered quite a few, I think. Yeah, well, actually, I mean, the first gadget everyone we think should have is a scanner, of course, and get rid of all that paper. But after that, we're enjoying these body bugs, and there's a number. If you go to lots of fitness clubs, you can get things that'll uh, help track your health like that. And I love this line, like Philips is doing, I think we're going to see a, a bunch of this exploding now, of more and more in-home devices to track our health, scales and blood pressure and so on. I, I think health is probably the most exciting part of all this, of how it can, can help our health. And then, uh, you know, we even have Apple announcing recently that their new little music players are going to record video and do a pedometer too, so it's almost right. everywhere for you. Yep, yep. Um, <clears throat> And then talk a little bit about, uh, first of all, security, Gordon. Do you ever, wh what is, what's the technical way that this data is secured if it's not living on your desktop? And do you worry about that? <laughs> it's it's physically, physically secure because there aren't, uh, you have to break through the Microsoft uh, network and whatever that, and uh, go in to find my machine and then, uh, and then get all the passwords for my machine to get, get in there. So I basically, it, uh, I don't, uh, the most data that's ever been displayed, you saw tonight about from, from me, and, and uh, so mo mostly it's not, not out there. So it resides on your machine, it's oh, not yeah. in the cloud. Yeah, or... it's not. Actually, the biggest risk we ever had, we used to have it all on notebook computers when it was small enough, right. and once we did a little tech show, and we used to take our actual life bits for the demo. We went on a lunch break. We came back, and there's a guy standing there <laughs> rifling through Gordon's life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jim, Jim Gray. When Jim, Jim Gray said, "Hey, why don't we take that corpus uh, and uh, make it available to the research community?" and, and uh, Jim and Roger said, "You don't want to do that." <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are and a lot of memos uh, in there, digital memos, and. Other things. Uh, and then what about the durability of this? Where do you have it backed up? How do you handle that? Oh, we backed it up many different ways. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a backup in, in the office. Uh, Vicki, uh, I, should, I should also mention Vicki Rosiski, who is part of the project, uh, uh, you know, like, I scanned all this data. I didn't do it. Vicki did most, most all of it. Uh, I'm, I did the first. Uh, uh, first bit of scanning on it, but uh, uh, but the uh, there's a there's a there's a copy there's a copy there, and then a, there's a copy that's up uh, backed up in uh, uh, in Redmond, uh, but um, and then there are a few other copies around. But. Okay, all of which are secure. You you feel good about them being tamper proof or? -proof? Uh, I don't feel that good about them. Okay. I mean I I. In fact, probably the most, two of the most uh, uh, ep interesting episodes were when I walked through security at Dulles, went into the, uh, was about to board the plane and discovered I, I had left my, uh, my life bits, the whole shebang in, lost the, it. in, the, in the security check, checkpoint. You know, now I, you know, who would ever leave their computer in a checkpoint in, in a TSA security? Well, about 100,000 people do that every year. And so I was merely one of them. And boy, was I glad to pay a couple hundred bucks to get that, draw, that machine back the next, next day. Huh. And, you know, frightening, I'd say. So that's probably the worst, one of the worst moments I've had, had in it. The second one was, you know, one day I, in Australia, I started up. I was the computer started up and it wouldn't start, and it turned out there was a uh, a bad board, bad board. And my first reaction was, uh, I had actually I had a backup computer with me, and and to, to see how how much whether I could operate with the backup, and then to find out that the that was jet, that it was the board, not the hard drive. The hard drive was intact, so. Uh, even though that was backed up also in uh, um, uh, in in San Francisco, but it's 
you don't even want to test back. I don't ever want to test back, I bet, but I thought that was a great, it was a great exercise to test it at least. Yeah. And, and, but you feel that way. Actually, NP, I ought to mention, coming down here today, NPR had a story of the, you know, in uh, Atlanta of uh, just, and these stories are all, you know, flood. Okay, all these people who've lost their, you know, they're saying, what did you lose? I lost my pictures. I don't have any sympathy for these guys. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, they lost their, they don't know what their birth certificate, well, you know, they don't have any of this stuff. All of that's, you know, you got wills, bills, codicils, all of this stuff. I don't have any of that, you know. All I have is some, some uh, worthless stock certificates <laughs> that are scans of them. <laughs> on a, but, uh, you know, basically, I don't have any paper. So, Jim, as we were talking mm -hmm. <clears throat> before this uh, session, I, you, know, you, you told me that you guys have been doing a lot of radio interviews and other things with more mainstream media. And I said, this is going to be a very technical audience, so they're going to want to get down into the, the technology of this and how it works. And sure enough, the first question uh, on the top of the stack here says, please, we're nerds. How is e-memory structured? So maybe you can talk a little bit about the technology behind well, all this. How is, it, how is it structured? Well, um, there's a certain level at which we discovered you don't want to structure it, a lot of it. Uh, as Gordon mentioned, you don't have the time in your life to structure everything. So what structure there is, um, and this is fascinating, we're used to files and folders and this kind of hierarchical structure. And when Gordon got on his binge of organizing things, we went crazy and tried to enable kind of everything we could. And we, oh, you could, put, it was kind of like tags, but they could do hierarchies too, and we had links between things. and we. But amazingly, what happened is, being in a database, just having attributes of things. I mean, I was astonished by how many of my folders had to do with time and place. And if you had the time and place attributes on your stuff, all those folders go away. And so I thought, when we got all these tools, oh, I'm going to build this grand scheme of organizing everything. Actually, it shrunk, 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 shrunk and when you have the data available. And that's why it's so key to be recording everything, so that you, you have these little memory hooks of, okay, I want to find the document that I wrote on that day that was really hot last year, or I want to find that picture that I took when I was at this place, or you know, things like that. So the biggest thing is to have all the attributes available, and then, uh, don't get me wrong, hierarchies will never go away, organization will never go away, but what happens is we organize really a small part of our lives, and, for instance, our web pages are just a, a gigantic bucket uh, that we can look up by text and by date, and a few of them we flag and organize, but it's a, a tiny amount. Well, we ought to point out that it's all of the metadata is in SQL, and, and that, that there's a very elaborate uh, mm -hmm. collection, a very nice uh, structure that allows you to build all of these things. But I went off and built a bunch, and I found and, and I, after I built them, they were very lovely, but it took forever to, to build them. I mean, because basically, I uh, operated as a ta taxonomist and a librarian for a year or two trying to do it. And, and I loved them, but, you know, I don't, I, and, and we thought there would be uh, schema and taxonomies that you'd sell and people would ha be trading those. And I don't, we're not there yet. I mean, the people who are in the semantic web business, I think, think that that's the way the world's going to go. I'm not, you know, I would uh, bet at least a few people here from Google would say, no, it's not going to go that way at all. Uh -huh. But, uh, so I think there's the librarian over here, and let me put the unstructured data over here, and these are, and so we're, we, you know, we love the librarians, but they're, they're, they're diminishing in number, and there's not enough time, there's too much information and not enough time to deal with the whole, with it, all the information in the library. Right, sense. although there's interesting automatic classifications. And for instance, for us, the hassle of saying, this is a bill, this is a dental bill, and so on. I think in the future, my bill will come in XML. It'll be yeah. marked up as a bill from a dentist. Uh, you know, there won't be work to taxonomize a lot of stuff, too. So uh, there's still room for it. And they're about, and I, I enumerated the number of data types, and there are like, 
uh, I think I got up to about 200 different things that you would identify, you know, a, 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 a greeting card, a grade card, a business card, things that had either, either distinguished by the content or by the format or, or size that, you, that you'd like to be able to retrieve by and you'd like a program to, anytime those things are identified, you'd like to have, have those known by the, by the system. Is there anything that you're using or that you foresee that in, in 50 or 75 years when your great-great-granddaughter mm. wants to call up this data and learn about you and, and explore your life bits, that, that you, you feel quite certain she'll be able to do that? Oh, I would, I would think so. That I think all of this, all of the thing, even the, no matter how I structure it or, or if, if I don't structure it at all, I think there's enough metadata in there to to for for them to ask a bunch of bunch of questions uh, uh, and uh, that that or data can be organized will uh -huh. be organized automatically and, mm -hmm. and I mean I do have that kind of faith in in computing that it'll be there right Jim do you do you think that's you it's see that out there on the oh, horizon? Oh, oh, yeah, especially, it's actually much harder for Gordon's corpus because there's so much that was old and was scanned. That's so different from yeah. a couple of years from now where every picture we, we take is going to have GPS, is going to have the location and the time already. That's so easy to cross-reference to your calendar and see what you were up to. I mean, your story will be much more readily available than uh, Gordon's well, Just Bits and the, and, the peop and the people are recognized, too. Yeah. So I mean, we're we're there basically. I mean, with facial recognition. And yeah, facial recognition or photographs. That's that's today, <clears throat> really. How much? Uh, obviously, working up the system was as much effort as it was to collect and save it all, Gordon. But when you think specifically about the time it took to collect and save it, how much? How much time and effort was that? And, and how much time do you spend? Sorting through it. First, I don't. We. It's hard to. We've never really put a. Uh, in 2001, when we were scanning all that. We had a. We put some cost data on it, and then. But that cost data varies all the time. Uh, you know, it's still to make a really good scan. We just scanned. Uh, had a scanning service scan a hundred of those. What I consider those beautiful museum uh, posters. Uh, the, one I, the particular ones I wanted were the 20 that we had of the 20 pioneers that we did in 1980, uh, 88 or so, or 19, uh, yeah, 1978 when uh, we started the museum. And uh, so those, those were scanned and they cost a buck a piece to make a really good high-res PDF of that. And uh, the, and the number, you know, you, it was, a few years ago, it was about 10 cents a page to scan, and uh, that's going down all the time, too. So there's some expense yeah. involved in this, ongoing uh, expense. Yeah, if you, if you do it that, if you do it that way, I mean, it's, uh, uh, the, the scanners, the scanners today are so beautiful, I mean, they're, uh, we recommend having a scanner. On, you know, everybody needs a scanner on their, their desk. Mm -hmm. but, but the amount that you scan has I, gone down a lot, too. So it oh used yeah. to be, what, a foot a year of paper that you had to yeah. scan, and what now it's, it's down to maybe three inches of, 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 of you know, whether it's letters or something. Yeah. More and more is born digital. Mostly so grandchildren's uh, drawings or something yeah. like that. Or, or it'll be, and, and very often, in Sydney, I don't even have a scanner. I, I photograph, I use a camera just to photograph, a, you know, if it's a bill or, I mean, the biggest problem are some of the bureaucracies of, I need a copy of this, you know, this bill or something. Uh, I haven't gotten, gotten it, uh, that across to, to all the bureaucracies yet that, that it's okay to have a scan of a bill versus the, uh. versus the bill. So here's one for both of you. Um, since your friend Peter Hart was in the uh, film, he, he's autographed this. Uh, hoping <laughs> uh -oh. you, I would ask it, Jim. So, nice uh, pictures of you, though. Peter. What's the most uh, What's the most noteworthy, in quotes, unexpected or interesting or useful 
recall that you've experienced from My Life Bits? Well, I think it's hard to come up with one because what it is, it's a whole bunch of little ones all the time. You know, like looking at the GPS trail of a, a trip I took and saying, oh, that must be an error in the GPS that's going off the road here and then zooming in and going, no, it's not. And the memory's flooding back to me. Oh, that's right, we made that stop there. It all comes back, something that was lost to my memory. Or, you know, uh, having con long conversations with people in email and hitting a point in the relationship and discovering by looking back over it, oh, this is a trend that was building and gaining insight. It's many, many little things that come to help out. Uh, not to mention, it seems like I get asked every second week by some sports team who says, you, we don't have your child's birth certificate, which is not true. I gave it to you three times already, but you know what? No problem. I can look that up and email it to you and I'm done. Mm. Gordon, how about you? I, all, I'd almost say it's the negative experience of going into the, to an emergency room, a new emergency room the other night and, and having too much information and, uh, and uh, thinking, and then as I, as I left, uh, vertically, uh, the, the, uh, uh, I asked the, EM, the, the EMR guy, I said, okay, what, what do you want when I walk in, <laughs> if I ever come in, if I ever have to see you again, what do you, what do you want me to bring in? And so, uh, those are things that now have to go into, now that can go in products. We can really put that in, that should be in, in the top, what I would call the top five in, uh, uh, in uh, Health Vault, yeah, because I've got all the, I've got a lot of stuff in Health Vault, but I didn't have the the uh, you know the latest uh, uh, stuff that I should have had, and then my hard drive or my key had you know a couple hundred megabytes, and that's foolish. I mean, that's fine to take to Australia or someplace like that when you really need somebody's got time to look through something. I mean, I. Uh, it's, you know, it's chronological, but uh, still there's just too much stuff there. Mm. Uh, so I think those, uh, I, f I kind of find that, I, I'd say every day I'm fine, there's something that, that there's a retrieval. Uh, or, or for example, just making this, making the movie, uh, Sheridan was able to go through, you know, the top, I don't know, 3,000 photographs or something, and, and make a production like that. And then there was a, we had a, uh, Gwen and I had a, our 75th birthday and she made 45 minutes of uh, a video uh, that included my sister and, and her ch children and so on. And all that came out of my life bit. So, I mean, that's probably the most production that you can get out, uh, out of, out of uh, and I think from a carrying stuff forward, there's a, the big, big need is sort of being able to produce something. And one of our early programs was interactive story by query. So the creation of story is stories. I think is the big app that we we think about, you know, for immortality or for you know for going forward or just for day to day people as opposed to, gee, I've got to find an email proving that I paid this bill or something like that. Because that always happens, yeah. No, here it is, I paid the bill, here's the record of it. So uh, you settle virtually all your disputes almost instantaneously. Defeating the bureaucrats. Right. Now, so we have a lot more philosophical questions here, actually, than we do technical questions. And, and one of them is, uh, there's, a, there's a theory that you talk about in the book, which is that uh, by spending less time on memory or maybe worrying about not being able to recall things. You have more time and more brain energy for things like creativity and innovation and learning. What do you, is that, have you found that to be true? Yeah, well, it's not necessarily less time for your memory. Part of it is the chores that we used to go through to recall things. And so in the book, we contrast the old days of going to the library and looking up a few articles and, and getting a few citations and coming back and you know, writing whatever you're writing about and saying, now we've got the internet, we bring things in, and if you have a copy of everything you've ever seen, you know, the next time you want to talk about the subject, 
you spend much less time recalling all of that. Oh, let's bring together everything I ever knew about this topic and I've got that in a very short amount of time. And now I'm free to, I can spend much more time on my new and creative thought because I have all my old stuff at my fingertips. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a lot less worry time. Uh, and in fact, if I almost regard if I don't get it on, on the computer s somehow, it will, it will be forgotten. And putting it on a scrap of paper uh, for, for very long is death. I mean, it, you know, uh, I won't be able to find, find that. Uh, and then almost anything you, any kind of remembering you need to do, uh, that, that, that phone number or that number, you will, re you will need that some other time. So that I find that there, you know, there's a very long tail where you only use it twice, but it's worth having, on, having there. Mm. Uh, know, another example, uh, I have a long commute to work and ideas occur to me, and it used to be I'd forget uh, half of them on the way. Or I'd sit there working for, okay, don't forget it, what are those three things I'm thinking? And now I uh, use a product called Recall, and I dial my phone, and it says Recall, and I say I want to add something, and I, you know, make a note of what I just thought of, I get it as an email with the transcription of what I said and the audio recording. It's not lost. And now I can keep thinking however creatively I can keep brainstorming and not lose that, oh yeah, remember to do this thing, or even the thoughts about what I'm brainstorming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, the, that's really what one of the purposes of the book was actually to stimulate all that. I mean, because we are seeing several uh, 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 tools there, live, the pen live scribe that remembers everything it's ever written and uh, or heard it, it hears and and then uh, uh, and then uh, Evernote that uh, that is basically a cell phone based device for photographing and for for memory and 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 recall. So here are three three products now that are out there that are doing the kind of thing that are help that are working on the various edges that where we, that we advocate. So we're feeling pretty good about that. This is this is not well. This is a, not a, just a research project, or 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 it's just a trend in evolution. Because it, sometimes we just look at it. Look, this is in, is inevitable. You know, it's going to happen, and we're just watching it and just just observe. It. We're observers as it's as it's evolving. You, uh, someone was, I think, stimulated by your mention of my cyber twin and the possibility of you being simulated, a simulated Gordon Bell out there in the future that someone can converse yeah. with based on all this data. Uh, are you, are you I'm, actively working on I'm, this? I'm actually doing that. Okay. I, yeah, and I don't know. I think I'm Gordon Bell. If you go to my cyber twin, one word. Uh, I can't remember what my password, or not my, well, not my password, <laughs> my name. I can't remember that at all, but, but, the, uh, uh, but uh, I think I'm Gordon Bell. If you go there, uh, you can talk to it a little bit. I've put in several hundred uh, questions. Uh, it's, it's a little bit clunky to put, uh, put stuff in, but it knows how many bits are, you know, it has some of the facts about my, <laughs> about Total Recall. And I wanted just to, just to uh, hammer away at that over the years and make it, make it know everything I know. Where do the answers come from? Right here. <laughs> yeah. And how are they digitized? No. I mean, how do well, I... right now, the, right now it's manual, manual. But in fact, uh, my cyber twin folks want to read the book, and they and put all of that in there, and and to get it. Okay. That's that's what it's got to be able to do. So it really has to read the book, and that's. Well, we really want to give them your hard drive. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, I'd be happy right now just to deal with the book, yeah. the book and then, then the hard drive, then they can go after that yeah. too. Yeah. But I think that can be done. I really, uh, I, I don't see any reason why it can't read, read my hard drive and, and, have, and anybody can have a conversation with that to the extent I let it go into these nooks and crannies. Yeah. Right? So, Jim, is memory like a muscle? Is it, will we lose it if we stop using it and sort of use these yeah. surrogates for it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I hear that a lot. Um, we're certainly going to use 
our memories differently. Uh, it's interesting, this conversation has gone on ever since writing was invented. And apparently Plato was concerned that if we wrote things down that would be disastrous for our memories. Which ironically we know because it was written down. <laughs> and um, you know all along humankind has made this trade off for I, I, can't, I can't chant my ancestors to the 20th generation like uh, people used to be able to and sing right. the song of my tribe and tell you all about it. So there's a lot of memory uh, that we're not so good at. And I think we're already not so good at remembering phone numbers. We're counting on our cell phones to have that in speed dial. But on the other hand, I don't know, my brain is still crammed full and I'm forgetting, I, I'm just remembering different stuff. So it's, it is a muscle and we do have to use it. I don't, I don't see any end to that. We're just going to be memorizing other things when we're freed up from uh, a lot of stuff. You know, anything that's good enough, if you can look it up in five seconds, which is probably what most of these facts and formulas and stuff will be able to do. Okay, that's fine, but there's other things we like, like on the tip of our tongues and we're going to keep memorizing them. Do you, um, do either of you ever find yourselves trying to inhibit things you don't want to remember? Uh, quit. Well, I had one experience with the, with, with, uh, when we lost Jim Gray. Right. Uh, you know, it was very painful to see any photographs come up. Uh, and so I, you know, I kind of left the room uh, there, or turned it off. Uh, and, but after a while, why that, those became, they, I passed through that, that period of mourning, and, and that became, a, those, now those photographs are very, ple very, uh, very, have very pleasant memories for me. Uh -huh. yeah. Jim, how about sort you? Bittersweet memories. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I think similar kind of thing with pictures of Gray, uh, Jim Gray in particular, um, strike you that way. I, but I guess, I guess there's the other part of that question, are there things that do you want to avoid recording? Um, yeah, I mean that happens and usually uh, you know, we get requests from people saying, hey, don't record this and, and that's fine. You know, part of this, I think we're not saying you ought to record everything in your life or you ought to roll video 24-7. We're saying you'll be able to. And it turns out that there's a lot of benefits to recording more. And you know, some people are going to go crazy and record 24-7. Other people will try to avoid it. But I actually think that even the people who think they're avoiding this will record way more than we've ever recorded before. We, what we do, we actually do advocate don't delete. And that's, that's mainly you know, uh, people say, I've got so many mail messages, I've got to delete those. I said, don't delete those mail messages, because you never know when, when you're looking for an address or somebody's name and, and it was something three years ago and you'll find, find it there, because it's not really doing any harm. That really doesn't take up that much space. I mean, mail, you know, all of your mail together, I mean, I've got maybe 10, 10 gigabytes of mail or a couple hundred, uh, only a couple hundred thousand mail messages. Now, a lot of to people here, that's a tiny <laughs> amount of, uh, of mail. And, uh, and, but uh, but you, still, it's still not that much. So. Yeah, but you, you don't want to delete that stuff because that, all of that, that traffic, that represents most of what, what goes on. And, and by the way, and I, I advocate that for corporations too. <laughs> Which is absolutely not what the li that flies in the face of all the lawyers here. Absolutely, uh, because I think you win more than you lose on being able to remember that, or I'm counting on the, you know, uh, being able to win more than I lose in terms of yeah that happened that way. See, <clears throat> you get all this great billing data on the internet now, and my son, who's uh, a junior in college, I was I was looking at our our cell phone bill the other night, <laughs> yeah. right? And it tells out how uh, every, the every number of texts, right? Oh, so yeah. I sent like to 63, who? my wife sent 42, my daughter's like 110. His was 867. Well, that's nothing. A 30-day period. Is, is he, is he going to want to save all those texts? I know it's nothing. I mean, a lot of people <laughs> do a lot, a lot more lot than people that. Are the thousands. I, I don't yeah. think he'd save, on you know, those, I don't think he'd save, though, those are, uh, yeah. 
Uh, they can't. Uh, I don't know. SMS, if you could, but if you could, yes. yeah, actually, you we can, did it. For, you can, you can do it, yeah, and sure. we, we were doing it for a while with the we had with the SMS. Stuff to go, yeah, yeah. The SMS. Yeah, absolutely. I think those are well. That's think of it. Wait a minute. What is Twitter other than well, yeah. <laughs> other than those those uh, those messages to the to the stars or something like that? Yeah. Instead of sending it to somebody, you have to just say it. So it's a place to say things where you have no one else to talk to. But, but you know, the SMS. Or, every, <laughs> or, or, or everybody else to talk to. I yeah. don't know. I'm here. Uh, that's funny. I, but you know, John, I, I I'm, think. I, I'm an ad for Twitter. I think your point was that there's a lot of these messages, and, and many, many, many of them are just mundane and not yeah. interesting. And why would I want to keep those? And, and this is true, but this is the wonderful thing with the storage yeah. involved here. It's like, why not keep yeah. them? And yeah. you it's never okay. know yeah. some little message. <laughs> it's the same reason why, yeah, you know, why true. do I have papers in my filing cabinet? I don't intend to look at all of them again, but I can't predict which one I might need, so I have to keep them all. Right. Here now, it's like, no problem. Keep all those text messages, and you never know what might turn out to be special. That's true. All right. This must be from a fellow MIT alum, Gordon, <laughs> because it's, uh, it's for you. And it, the question is, what was or what is your greatest MIT recall? from all of this. I, I don't know whether going to my 50th reunion. Uh, um, I don't know, just ha uh, oh, ha sort of having the you know, photographs or having, being able to go back and look at, look at, it turns out to be the second paper I'd ever written, which turned out to, you know, uh, I was with the right, right, it turns out I'm, I'm very lucky in terms of the people that I've been able to associate with, uh, that we wrote a classic paper there, and just being able to go back and look at, at, at that first, uh, first paper on speech recognition, deciding, it, you know, after, after I'd worked on writing it, or be, doing the work for it, and, and being part of the, group who, who did the work, uh, deciding that speech was just too hard and I was going to get out of that because I was an engineer, I wanted to build stuff, and I knew that speech would take 20 years. Well, it took 20 years to get, uh, it actually took 20 years to get to where we are now, or 40 years to get there. So again, I was off by a factor of two or so, but uh, the, uh, I, I don't know, just, you know, being able to, uh, I, yeah, I don't have any, any inter, I don't know, I don't think of any interesting stories of, of being, of, you know, pranks or stuff like that. I just, it, for me, it was an enjoyable uh, uh, experience, and now when I go back, I would, I look at all these kids and I say, oh my God, I really am glad I got got there when I did because they, everybody turned smart after I left or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, the, but it was, uh, uh, you know, so I, I, I just think, you know, I, and I actually had my, my, my thesis in there that, uh, uh, that's, that's on part of, uh, actually I think, I don't think the museum has, has one, but I've, but I've scanned that, mm -hmm. and uh, and then also there's a picture of doing this work, the speech work uh, that that came up that yeah. was up here, and that that was a TX zero. So I have wonderfully fond memories of that, and I always remember. I'll, I'll say, and I don't, he's probably not here. Peter Deutsch, who was a Berkeley grad, and uh, many of you probably know, he was I think at Park, and uh, I remember. Uh, I was doing this speech work, and they had this, ma uh, they had just, I don't know, somebody had made a new macro assembler. And of course, yeah, and uh, Peter, Peter was, I think, 11 or 12 at the time, and he would come up and, you know, I'd say, Peter, I, I, I uh, this macro got in a loop. What do, what do I do now? Uh, well, you forget the comma here, and this should be indented. So Peter Deutsch at 11 was debugging, helping me debug program. <laughs> <laughs>
he wrote, and I think Peter was recognized as he wrote a, a list for a PDP-8 uh, while he was at, at one of the, uh, in prep school or something. So, but many of you know Peter and so how bright he is. And, so I'm going to, um, I'm going to give the last question uh, to this, this question, which sort of allows you both to sum everything up. Jim, starting with you, uh, the quote at the end of your presentation was, total recall will change everything. And uh, what kind of changes, aside from the health aspects that we've talked about, do you expect as the result of all of this? Uh, yeah, well, in the book, we break it down into memory, so just better remembrance of things. Uh, it's going to make you more productive at work. Uh, it's going to enable people to take over jobs of their predecessors and inherit their memories. It's going to give corporate-wide memories uh, so that next time I phone up my cell phone provider, they don't uh, pretend like they never heard from me before and they didn't give me advice already. Um, it's going to enable us to, I mean, part of it is just enjoyment and nostalgia. And I mean, we already love photo albums and videos and so on. There's going to be more of that. And we're going to pass on more to posterity. Gordon? Yeah, I, I think people have to recognize that that's what's happening. That memory, you know, right now we're, a lot of us, we're enamored with the communication aspects of, you know, uh, we're thinking of it as communication. And I think of it because that's here and now, and it's just a slice in time. But what, what I think maybe it was an aha of, that I'm still having uh, about the stuff that I have, which was it got to be interesting because I had, you know, I had the, uh, a, a deed that went back to 1850 or so, or pictures of my parents, scans of pictures of my parents of, in the year, uh, just before the, uh, the turn of the 1900s. So that, it was, ha what, when, it, when it got interesting for us was having it all there. And then Jim, Jim's, Jim is building the project, got into it and said, I've got to use this too. I mean, it's like, I'm not building this for Gordon, I'm building this for the world. And, and that, was, uh, that was a real uh, thing. So you have, you know, everybody can, everybody, in, we think everybody inherently is doing what we're doing now. They just aren't recognizing it. So it's important to recognize it, you know, and back up your hard drives and, and, and put more and more <laughs> in there and then, and look for the uh, uh, sort of low-hanging fruit, uh, you know, whether it's finance or whether it's uh, health data or something like that, where there's a real payoff, because I think there's a huge, Huge payoff. I think, I think it's, you know, we, we think it's green. You know, <laughs> what could be greener than this? Getting rid of paper, not filing stuff. I mean, I hardly ever print anything anymore. I, uh, in fact, my printer uh, is currently broken, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I'm not sure what I'm going to. I think I need to print, but it's. Uh, <laughs> But uh, so it'll I'm, change a lot of things, and then some yeah, things remain constant. Yeah, it but like. uh, filing and printing, no filing cabinets, no printing. So there's a lot to be saved by not having this crap, you know, <laughs> dealing with all this physical crap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take care of a little business before we go downstairs for the book signing, which is coming up in a minute. First of all, we have we have a gift for each of you. I'm gonna get it over here. Gordon, I think for you this will look very familiar, but this is a copy of uh, Core okay. Memory. Okay. Uh, as if you needed another book and more paper, but I hope you can scan <laughs> this in. No, we have to scan and, and, and it. And, I you, think and you too. <laughs> thank you. you. Thank scan you. you know, this, we will, yeah. uh, if, if okay. you want to rip the spine off of it and okay. scan it in, that's, uh, well, that's I'm actually fantastic. I'm sure I, I can get the. the uh, <laughs> Uh, a lot of them look very version. familiar to you. Yeah, these are old, old friend, pictures of old friends in here, yeah. Second, I, uh, I want to oh, say thank you to some people. Okay. Um, first of all, in addition to Gordon Bell, who's a fellow at the museum here, we have some fellows here tonight, and it's always important when we have fellows. I always like to recognize them, so uh, thank you and welcome to Paul Barron, Chuck Thacker, and Steve Wozniak, who are here tonight. Uh, I want to thank Microsoft. Uh, absolutely. I want to thank Microsoft for its generous support uh, tonight, and also Penguin's Dutton Division, which is the publisher of the uh, book and made books available tonight, and for Kepler's, 
especially because Kepler's is making all of the books available, has donated those to the museum tonight for the book signing downstairs. I want to be sure and welcome C-SPAN, uh, which is here tonight, and remind all of you that uh, this will be one of the book TV uh, broadcasts on C-SPAN, so keep your eye out for the TV listings. Thank you for being here tonight, and most of all, thanks to our guests, Jim Gimmel and Gordon Bell, for being with us. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.